Toronto is a historical meeting place uh, for the indigenous peoples, a uh, meeting place of the Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, the Seneca, the Huron-Waudan, the Neutrals, and other peoples. Uh, this territory is still under uh, various land claims of the Mississauga of the New Credit. Uh, we just want to acknowledge the historical uh, uh, presence and importance of the Aboriginal peoples to this area and the unclaimed uh, issues from colonialism that linger on. In looking at uh, the Ukraine uh, and Russia uh, and conflict in the world, the Bulletin of Atomic Society has recently uh, moved the danger clock ahead. Uh, given the uh, disruptions there and the worries about uh, 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 very, very sharp conflict, including conflict using nuclear weapons. Uh, this has uh, follows a very long period of, of tensions rising uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, a, a, about a decade of pressures from NATO enlargement, uh, di di different destabilization measures in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Uh, these have been taking place uh, very intently over the last uh, uh, two years since the uh, uprising of, of the Medan in Kiev, uh, which was a chaotic, comp uh, complex mix of popular forces, rightist forces, imperialist forces, nationalist forces, and so on. Uh, the conflict that unfolded then uh, uh, with the new U Ukrainian regime and the, and the power structures that became intersected have, have, uh, have uh, uh, sharpened issues of conflict between Russia and the, and the Ukraine, particularly over the eastern Ukraine and Crimea, the rights of the Russian-speaking peoples in the Donbas and Crimea in particular, uh, and the intertwining conflicts between the oligarchs between the two, in the two states. Uh, this has led to rising military deployments over the last number of months, uh, particularly uh, NATO uh, troop deployments and military exercises, uh, which have been the largest in 30, 40 years, uh, exercise over the last six months in the Black Sea, the Baltics, and the Arctic. These have included NATO deploying nuclear uh, bombers as part of these exercises and the installment of a range of new uh, NATO deployments on the Russian, uh, on the Russian border. Uh, Canada, as we know, has been probably been the most vociferous of uh, the NATO countries uh, in backing uh, 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 the Ukraine and back, uh, the, the uh, Ukrainian government and the NATO deployment. These have included moving jet fighters and troops into forward deployments along Eastern Europe. Uh, Canada has been leading the push for the harshest sanctions against uh, Russia and been pushing also for diplomatic isolation. Uh, Russia, in turn, has deployed and engaged in a range of, uh, of military exercises at a scale and uh, in places it hasn't for quite some time. Uh, this also includes upping, upping the, great, the quality uh, and long-term plans of their own nuclear weapons, of particularly along the, uh, the, the Russian western borders. So the tensions here are extreme and rising, and that is the reason for the warnings of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Um, we have today a series of speakers eminently qualified to uh, speak on these issues. First up will be Judy Deutsch. Yeah. Elena. Elena, Elena, okay, <laughs> I messed up. Elena. <laughs> Elena. <laughs> Mokarushna. Uh, who will speak? Who has uh, been speaking on the Ukraine over the last uh, 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 few years? Uh, she's a doctoral student in sociology at the University of Ottawa. If you read the, the web, uh, you'll have seen some of her writings in Counterpunch, uh, Truth Out, uh, Truth Dig, The New Cold War, and so on. She will be followed by <laughs> Sergey. <laughs> okay. Sergei uh, Plek Plekhanov, uh, uh, who uh, was educated at the uh, Moscow State Institute of International Relations uh, and holds a PhD in history uh, from the Institute of the Study of the U.S. and Canada in the Academy of Sciences of the old USSR. Uh, he's one of my colleagues at the Department of Political Science in York University as director of the South and Central Asia Project at, at York. Uh, 
Uh, he has written widely on a whole set of issues of the post-communist transformation in Russia and Eastern Europe and is one of the most well-known commentators on these issues in Canada. And I'll get this right. <laughs> Judy, Judy will uh, speak last, Judy Deutsch, uh, speaking on patterns of U.S. hegemony. Uh, Judy has a degree in history from UCLA, is a psychoanalyst, uh, active in, on the editorial board of Canadian Dimension, a former chair of Science for Peace, which is also sponsoring today's event. So we will start with Lynn. So I'll just say a couple of words what I will be talking about today. I wanted to talk about what I think is one of the problems at the root of the war between Ukraine, as we witnessed it since last spring. And what I'm going to uh, state today is not very original. This idea has been in, in Ukrainian studies of where we know Ukraine for at least 24 years of Ukrainian independence. And namely, I, okay, I will be talking about uh, um, split of on East uh, and West in Ukraine and how it played out since Ukraine became independent in 1991. Because historically, Ukraine has been uh, um, a divided country, and when you read uh, literature on, on uh, Ukraine, you will see this common theme that goes through all the literature that we have two, two Ukraines. We, we have Western Ukraine and we have Eastern Ukraine. Western, and, and uh, there are deep historical reasons for that. Uh, two Ukraines belonging to two empires in, in, um, for the, in 17th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, the Eastern Ukraine, uh, of course I'm generalizing, it's not precisely Eastern Ukraine, this uh, definition does not correspond to geographical borders, what I mean by Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine is rather um, this uh, ideal, typical construction, right, in terms of oriented to, to, to the East, to Russia, and oriented to the West, to Europe. So we have uh, the uh, Central and Eastern and Southern Ukraine belonging to Russian Empire until 1917, and we have Western Ukraine belonging to austro hungarian Empire, right? So st st uh, stemming from that, uh, belonging to the two different cultural spaces, we have this split in, in terms of political and cultural orientation in Ukraine. And based on these cultural differences, uh, there are two different uh, projects uh, for um, the future of Ukraine as a, as a nation, as a state. And uh, my uh, argument tonight is that throughout these 24 years of uh, independence, uh, the political elite of Ukraine has not been able, unfortunately, to uh, formulate and to propose a national project that would unite these two different Ukraines. Uh, whether sh they did it, they tried, but uh, to, at this point of time, my, my original argument was that they did, want, did, did not want to do it, but I'm not, these days I, I, I'm asking myself whether they could produce such a national uh, project. So we have these two different identities, uh, Western Ukrainian and Eastern Ukrainian. As I said, Western Ukrainian is oriented to, towards Europe and uh, in Western Ukraine, uh, um, the epitome of Western Ukraine is uh, Galicia, who has always claimed to belong to European cultural space. Uh, they hold uh, so-called Western values and, and the nationalist project, uh, na national citizenship project for Ukraine, meaning that uh, ethnic Ukrainians should form the core uh, of, of the Ukrainian uh, state of the Ukrainian nationhood. Again, the Ukrainian language is the essence and, and, and the um, foundation of the, of the Ukrainian identity and as a way to preserve the Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian uh, land, uh, Ukrainian identity. Uh, if we go back in uh, the recent, or more or less uh, recent, uh, recent history, uh, one of the dividing issues between Western and Eastern Ukraine are memories of the Second, uh, or Second World War, or the Great Patriotic War, and the issue of, of organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army. Uh, if you follow Ukrainian politics, you know that in 2015, uh, months, not even a month ago, uh, Yushchenko, uh, sorry, Poroshenko signed uh, the um, law on decommunization. And according to this law, these uh, na Ukrainian nationalists who fought against uh, the Soviet troops in, in the Second World War, they are declared na national heroes. While for Eastern Ukraine, especially for Donbass, who is now fighting for um, its. Um, the, the, the war with uh, the other uh, Ukraine, uh, these uh, 
people for whom Bandera was, uh, but Bandera is a fascist or a Nazi for Eastern Ukraine. And of course, for Eastern Ukrainian identity, they have, because they have belonged to this Russian cultural space, they always, uh, throughout all the years of the Ukrainian independence, you see them asking that Russian language be recognized as the second official language in, in Ukraine, and uh, even those pro-Russian presidents who came, uh, for instance, Kuchma in, and uh, Yanukovych, when they were running their presidential campaign, they would promise the uh, electorate that they would do it, and once in Kiev, with the perspective changes, there is this part that uh, says that the, your sitting position uh, determines your perspective, or something like this. So once in Kiev, the perspective changes, and they drop this promise to um, give the Russian the, the official status of the second language in, in Ukraine. Of course, we have this great patriotic war and pride in the Soviet victory. And as I said, the, the leader of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, um, Stepan Bandera, is a fascist or a Nazi for Eastern Ukraine. So let us, uh, uh, I'll start with the first, uh, I forgot to ask Greg, if once I am 15 minutes, so can you work more? So we have a um, brief history of Ukrainian independence. On uh, in December 1st, 1991, Ukraine hold, uh, held an all-national referendum on independence. And the question was simple whether you support the Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine becoming an independent country and uh, over 90% uh, voted in favor. And on the same day, uh, we um, had the first presidential election in Ukraine. And there were two candidates, Leonid Kravchuk, the former communist, and Vyacheslav Chernovil, who was representing the national democratic um, forces in Ukraine. So in, uh, as you can see, uh, Kravchuk is in blue and Chernovil is in um, yellow. So only three Western regions voted for Chernovil, who, who, who was a prominent Ukrainian dissident, and who was, he's actually, the, the irony of these elections is that Kravchuk was, um, Kravchuk was born in Rivne, who is, who, I don't know if you see the, the, the map of uh, Ukraine, but Rivne is uh, in the upper part of the map, it's considered Western Ukraine. So Kravchuk was uh, uh, born in Western Ukraine, but he was considered not to be a, um, national candidate. Chernovil, who was born in, in, in Cherkask, was, was considered in, uh, representing the nationalist interests for, uh, for Ukraine. And uh, Chernovil, um, a, a part of the National Democrats, they supported Kravchuk because they knew that Chernovil basically he didn't stand any chance to be elected in, in uh, Eastern Ukraine and in, in the rest of Ukraine because it's, remember, we are talking about 1991, right? So the first uh, Ukrainian president Leonid Kravchuk uh, uh, was known uh, for his uh, uh, expression that he said in one of the interviews he was a uh, master of sleeping between the raindrops, meaning that he had a very balanced, a very really cunning, really cautious position. He would not uh, endorse any radical political move, in, 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 uh, not on, on behalf of the national camp, not on behalf, on behalf of the communists. He, he was a even within the Communist Party, because he was responsible for the um, ideology department within the Communist Party of Ukraine. And uh, with the uh, last years of uh, Perestroika, 89, uh, 90, he, become, he starts um, taking more and more pro-Ukrainian uh, independence position. So, and he was one of the, of the three leaders who took um, the decision to dissolve the Soviet Union following the referendum on Ukrainian independence on December 1st, 1991. So three of them, uh, Kravchuk, um, uh, Yeltsin and Shushkevich, thank you. They signed this accord in Belovezh on uh, December 8, 1991 to dissolve the um, Soviet Union. Uh, Kravchuk is a president, first president of independent Ukraine. He followed the um, politics of balance uh, in, between Europe and, and Russia. And under his presidency, Ukraine, uh, he wanted Ukraine to become a reliable bridge between Russia and Central Eastern Europe. So he really walked a very thin and careful line between these two uh, centers of, uh, of power. 
he um, but he was more on on, on the um, independent Ukraine side because, for instance, when they signed uh, the, the when the Soviet Union was dissolved in, in its place, the Commonwealth of Independent States was created, and Kranchuk was the one who refused to have common uh, military forces and, and common currency. So he really wanted to take Ukraine um, a little bit away from uh, from the Russian influence. He. Uh, it, the early 90s in Ukraine was a catastrophe in terms of, in terms of economic politics. Um, he um, was involved in one of the the, the privatization that he tried uh, that he uh, started um, carrying out was uh, full of uh, corruption and scandals. And one of the most uh, famous scandals of this time is a scandal around the merchant flee of, of the Black Sea. His uh, son was. Uh, involved in that scandal and was, uh, it was believed that he basically he, it, it, that fee was uh, sold for uh, really peanuts on, uh, for uh, false debts and, and Kravchuk's son uh, was behind this the, the purchase of this uh, uh, fleet. So, but increasing tensions with Russia in, in this disastrous economic um, policies in terms of, of the cultural po uh, policy for instance one of the issues that divided Western and Eastern Ukraine was the um, question of, of the Great Famine of 1932-1933, uh, the, the, the Great Famine or Holodomor in, in Ukraine. And Kravchuk, interestingly, interestingly, he from the start took this position that Ukrainian famine was a genocide against Ukrainian people. He stated in 1993 that it looks, for him, it looks like it was really a plan genocide against uh, Ukrainians. Um, so, like, as I said, increasing tensions with Russia and these disastrous economic politics uh, lead to Kravchuk losing uh, popularity. And uh, in, in the presidential election of 1994, he loses to uh, a representative of um, industrial elites uh, from um, Dnipropetrovsk to Leonid Kuchma, as you, because the, the presidential elections in Ukraine, you, you, you have several candidates and whoever uh, gathers the most uh, votes in the first round, then passes to the second round, and in a round off, uh, you need to um, to collect more than 50% uh, 50, 50 of, of the votes to become a president. So in, in, in these presidential elections of 94, we clearly see that split between uh, Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine, and this is these elections are first to demonstrate that split. We see that all the industrial uh, part of Ukraine uh, votes for Kuchma, and, and uh, uh, Western Ukraine votes for uh, Kravchuk. Uh, Kuchma uh, is uh, a representative of what we. What what are called red directors in, in, in Western social sciences? He had a successful career in, in uh, Dnipropetrovsk. He for for um, many years he was a um, director general of the Yuzhny um, machine building plant. Uh, before he got involved in uh, politics, I have a lot to say, but I have to to keep going. So. I'll just talk about his uh, um, politics uh, in, in foreign um, relations in, in, within Ukraine. Uh, Kuchma, also, Kuchma continued basically this um, line that Kravchuk started, meaning keeping um, that balance between uh, Russia and Europe. Uh, Kuchma called it a multi-vector foreign policy. He um, um, one of the contentious issues between Ukraine and Russia was the question of um, of the Black Sea Fleet, which not not sold under Kravchuk, and was sold under um, Kuchma. When in May of 1997, uh, Ukraine and Russia signed uh, the Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Partnership, because Kuchma wanted Ukraine to. Um, Become a member of uh, what, it, what was called then? Was it called customs? Uh, 
Customs Union. Customs Union. Let, let's put it uh, this way. He wanted Ukraine to, to be part of, uh, to, uh, to integrate into economic space with Russia, Kazakhstan, and uh, Belarus. And he also um, advocated for a free zone uh, with uh, Europe. Uh, he, he, in uh, economic politics, he was a um, partisan of um, uh, economic reforms, lowering um, taxes, uh, <laughs> not um, taking, not, um, not controlling um, prices in the economy. Um, he, under his uh, presidency, we see the, the, the formation of this oligarchic, uh, industrial, financial oligarchic system that is, play, is in place now in uh, Ukraine, because under his uh, presidency he started um, privatization, uh, called on, on certificates, meaning that these state enterprises were transformed in joint stock companies, and the idea was that Every citizen could buy uh, their share, but uh, the critics of, uh, of Kuchma stated that it, it went wrong, and, and these uh, assets ended up in the uh, hands of several uh, oligarchs. But he had the same idea for, for the land, that people who uh, work the land would be able to purchase uh, small shares and, and um, become... Um, and uh, Kuchma, this constitution of Ukraine was also adopted in 1996. Because it took five years to, to vote for that constitution, and basically on uh, June 28, uh, 1996, Kuchma basically locked uh, Ukrainian MPs within the parliament, and in one sitting, 24 hours, they finally adopted the constitution because they kept uh, discussing and proposing amendments. And, and uh, Kuchma was also the only president who was uh, elected twice from 1994 to 2004. So he, in, in the presidential election of 1999, he ran uh, against uh, his main rival was Petro Simonenko, the leader of the Communist Party of Ukraine. And you will see the results in, uh, in, in this uh, election, it's interesting, but if you remember, the, I, I cannot go to the previous one, but you see now uh, Kuchma got his support from Western Ukraine mostly. Why is that? Well, very simple, because his rival was communist Petro Simonenko. Right? So it was a vote against, not so much vote for, it was vote against. So, um, Kuchma, like I said, Kuchma was um, again balancing between uh, uh, Europe and uh, Russia. And um, he, he was the one who appointed Yushchenko, who would later become the third president of Ukraine, he appointed him as the prime minister. Why? Because uh, Yushchenko was a successful banker and, and, uh, when he was the head of the National Bank, uh, the, the, they carried out the financial reform and, and uh, the inflation went down from four digits to two, di two digits. Uh, Kuchma really, um, in spite of these ideological um, differences with Yushchenko, he really uh, appreciated him as a um, effective manager. But in, in 2000, um, what happens, Kuchma becomes entangled in, in so-called uh, cassette scandal with um, um, Melnichenko. He was, Kuchma was um, accused of selling arms uh, to uh, Saddam Hussein. Why, it's called, why it was called cassette scandal? Because Melichenko was Yushchenko's bodyguard from, uh, sorry, Kuchma's bodyguard from 1908 to 2000. So they um, released these uh, re recordings according to which uh, Kuchma uh, ratified this decision to sell arms to Saddam Hussein and also to kill a, a journalist who was an emblematic symbol of freedom of press in Ukraine, Gondadze. He was an opposition journalist who would constantly claim that, he's, uh, that the regime is after him and, and the freedom of speech in, in, in Ukraine is restrained and then the security services are um, threatening him. In, 2000, in, in, in the fall of 2000, he uh, disappeared in September, this journalist, and they found him two months later beheaded in, 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 in the woods uh, on the cave. 
So because uh, because of this cassette uh, scandals, uh, Kuchma Kuchma's reputation was tainted, and we see mass protests staged by uh, by the opposition in, in the parliament, and the opposition was. Uh, led by, um, by by Prime Minister, who was dismissed by the time, Yushchenko. So we have mass protests in Kiev. Uh, it's called U Ukraine without Kuchma. And they also labeled that scandal Kuchma Gate. Of course, they started an investigation. The investigation has never been completed, and they were never able to prove that Kuchma was involved in all of this. And they never... Uh, it's, Kuchma denied his fault all, all the way. So with Kuchma tainted, and, and uh, he, um, the Constitutional Court ruled actually that Kuchma could run for the third term, but he said, according to the Ukrainian Constitution, I, I can only run for two terms, so I'm stepping down, I want to look at Ukraine without Kuchma with you. And when he steps down, he supports Viktor Yanukovych, who comes from uh, the, the, the Ust the last president of the last president before Poroshenko. He gives his support to Yanukovych. So in 2004, what we have, we have an orange revolution, right? Which really be becomes, uh, th that's where the country really splits in, in two, because you have, um, you have Yushchenko, who represents Western orientation, who, who is supported by the West, who is uh, also a nationalist, and we have Viktor Yushchenko, uh, yes, Viktor Yanukovych, who comes from uh, Eastern Ukraine, and who represents represents that industrial financial elite, uh, Russian-speaking industrial elite of Ukraine. And uh, there are two uh, uh, rounds. In the second round, Yanukovych claims the victory, but um, the West does not accept the results. Uh, uh, also, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians who supported Yushchenko claimed that it was uh, largely fraud in the results of the election. We have massive protests in, in, in Kiev, and the third round of is, is um, brings to victory Yushchenko. What do we have? Uh, Yushchenko uh, became uh, known for his, uh, in terms of cultural poli policies, he's the one who pushed the agenda with the um, Ukrainian Great Famine to be recognized as a genocide against um, Ukrainians. He uh, proposed a law according to which whoever denies Ukrainian famine as a genocide is, uh, can be punishable by law. They vote for that law, of course, as in many laws in Ukraine it has never been enforced, but the, the, the law is out there. Uh, under Yushchenko's presidency, the relationship with Russia deteriorates really badly. He, uh, Yushchenko believes that Ukraine and Russia have two, are, two different, um, are based on two different cultures, two different values. Ukraine being uh, a Western country and Russia being you know, this uh, stereotype of, of um, uh, Oriental collectivistic, um, tyrannic uh, country. That's what he stated, that he does not think that Russia and Ukraine can really coexist in one space because these are two different uh, cultures. What uh, Yushchenko's period is also known by this endless quarrels was Yulia Tymoshenko, his former ally from the Orange Camp. They compete for uh, they, they are not comfortable personally, they have political differences and uh, the, you, this, the whole Yushchenko period is one constant political crisis in Ukraine. So when uh, the elections of 2010 come, um, I, I, I just cannot talk about all this, hopefully you, maybe you will have questions, I will answer them. So in 2010 election, Yushchenko final, uh, Yanukovych can, uh, is claiming the victory because this time he wins in, in the runoff against uh, Yulia Tymoshenko. When Yanukovych comes in, into office, he uh, takes out of the foreign, of the priorities of the foreign policy of Ukraine, uh, joining NATO, which was advocated by uh, Yushchenko. He says that uh, he goes back to the original idea of, of Kravchuk of creating this uh, European architecture of, of security in which 
Ukraine and, and uh, Russia and Europe would uh, belong. He also uh, stated and, and that provoked an uproar in, within the Ukrainian community, especially in Canada, that the Ukrainian famine is not a genocide because it affected all uh, other areas in Russia and in Kazakhstan and, and uh, it should not be termed uh, genocide. He also, Yanukovych talks about bringing together Eastern and uh, Western Ukraine. And he declared also that Ukraine, Ukraine would continue its course to uh, joining the European uh, Union. It's an interesting detail because uh, you know, one of the, the big questions in, in, in the Euromaidan revolution was whether Yanukovych gave that order to disperse the protests on Maidan. And my understanding is he did not give an order because if you follow the logic of his actions, he it, it it's just does not inscribe him in, in his type of, of personality. It's interesting, in 2009 he gave an interview when he talked about uh, this um, Orange Revolution and when he claimed to won the second tour of, of elections. He said that uh, his supporters were ready to come to, to Kyiv. Actually, they were almost there, but by, they came from Donetsk by, by, by train. And he told them, go back to Donetsk because I don't want uh, bloodshed in Kyiv. I don't want, you know, the, the uh, dead bodies of Ukrainians to flow down the river because of these elections. So he, Yanukovych, um, and when you, when I was reading these materials about uh, in, in, the, in Yanukovych's electoral campaign, and even after that, when you read those materials, you, you see these two Ukraines, you know, the so the. the European Ukraine and, 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 and this other Ukraine which is backward, which is... Uh, it, they really denigrated the, the, the Yanukovych. And when you see, for instance, uh, because the issue of the language would constantly be brought upon, right? Yanukovych, they would mock Yanukovych because of his poor knowledge of Ukrainian language. The same with Azarov, the Prime Minister. In, uh, I was watching a video with um, Azaro presenting, um, I believe it was a budget, and one of the deputies from the Svoboda party, the famous Irina Farion, he, she said, and that, you know, I know only two types of people who cannot learn a language. The one because they have, um, don't you remember the first one, and uh, the second class is because they are mentally challenged. So to which category do you belong? No, then his, her comments were not about the essence of, of the budget he was proposing, but it was about the, the language. And all throughout this period you see these two uh, very important ideological questions of language and, and um, political orientation of Ukraine being played out constantly since 1991. And, and when you read the uh, analysis by sociologists, political scientists, uh, Ukrainian uh, scientists, you see that they all talk about this division, especially in the light of the, after the Orange Revolution. And they are all you know, ringing the bell, so to speak, the, the alarming the, the political elite that you have to do something. Because this country is drifting apart. Now, because after 2004, it became really clear that, you know, that this country is divided. And something needs to be done. There should have been some exchanges between the regions, but the, the problem is that they have never really come up with a project that would propose something that in which these two Ukrainians would, would recognize themselves. Because so you, you, if you have two different uh, projects, you, you have to somehow to find a common ground. And then there were suggestions that what would be um, that common ground would be a welfare state, it would be a state that takes care of uh, its citizens. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it did not uh, materialize, so I, uh, I will stop on this. And if you have some questions, I will be happy to answer them. Now. from uh, Elena's background on uh, the history of Ukraine to uh, Sergei taking on some of the geopolitics uh, of Russia and uh, the new Cold War.
in uh, Eastern Europe. Sergey. Thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, this has been uh, a, a very, very uh, good way of introducing uh, you to the fractured politics of Ukraine. And uh, there are countries which uh, have, uh, you know, big issues with, uh, with their uh, cap capacity to maintain some sort of a consensus which would prevent political conflicts which are always there to some degree or another. Uh, from from actually uh, generating a civil war. In Ukraine, unfortunately, we have had a political conflict which originally was centered on a foreign policy decision, the decision of President Yanukovych, who actually made a tremendous contribution to the work between the European Union and Ukraine uh, toward signing uh, an agreement of association between uh, EU and, and Ukraine. And, and uh, the same president at the last moment decided to postpone the signing uh, because the terms, the economic terms that Europe was offering were not sufficient uh, from the point of view of the national interests of Ukraine. So it wasn't an issue of bye-bye Europe, I'm going to be in bed with Russia, no. Uh, Yanukovych was in the same uh, tradition of all Ukrainian leaders uh, since 1991, trying to balance its uh, involvement with the West and, and with Russia. However, the, the opposition, the nationalist opposition in Ukraine, uh, virtually declared a political war on Yanukovych uh, over uh, this foreign policy issue. And, uh, what followed was uh, the uh, familiar sight in Ukraine, uh, politics of the street, uh, opposition forces managing to uh, deploy enough uh, bodies uh, in front of the government buildings and camping out, uh, clashing with the police and so on. Uh, it was difficult to imagine when this conflict was escalating in uh, December of uh, 2013, then January, and. Uh, the standoff continued and the attempts to resolve the, uh, the conflict by means of some kind of a compromise between the government and the opposition were, were failing. It was difficult to imagine that a few months later uh, it would be a situation of civil war. Now why, how could Ukraine slide into a civil war? The costs of this civil war, by the way, uh, are enormous. Uh, the official data uh, from the United Nations on the number of people killed in the Ukrainian conflict since uh, February, late February of, of 1914 is 6,000. But unofficial estimates, in particular one coming from the German intelligence service, puts the number at 50,000. And that was from a report that was <coughs> leaked to the media in Germany uh, in, uh, in, in February of this year. Uh, apparently the 6,000 figure includes only the civilians, uh, victims of, uh, of the war, and the rest of the figure of 50,000 includes the, the actual fighters on both sides, the Ukrainian army and the rebel forces of eastern Ukraine. Now, Ukraine has, sub it's been a massive tragedy for the country because uh, apart from the loss of life, Ukraine, the Ukrainian state has been shattered. Ukraine has lost some territory. The governability of the country has declined to a very, very low point. Uh, its economy has contracted by one-fifth, and uh, uh, it's actually, right now, it's on the brink of default. It may actually default on, uh, on, on, its, uh, on its debt. Uh, because its economy is uh, continuing to slide into uh, depression and there's simply no money to repay the debts. Uh, the Ukraine crisis was, had important international dimensions to begin with. As I've mentioned, it starts with a, foreign pol a debate, a dispute over a foreign policy decision. And uh, it's not surprising that uh, external actors were involved in the crisis from day one. The West, Russia, even before the annexation of Crimea, which was, of course, uh, uh, an extreme uh, point of, of this foreign involvement. Uh, if the West had not supported the Ukrainian opposition, the Yanukovych government would not have been overthrown. 
I mean, it's obvious from, from uh, any objective analysis, reading of the objective analysis of, of the circumstances of the, uh, of the overthrow of the government. It was a legitimate government which was democratically elected. It had a majority in the parliament and was overthrown as a result of consistent attacks, militant attacks on the government precipitating uh, uh, violent clashes in a situation where every time the government would try to use force against the protesters, there would be enormous pressure from the West. Don't do that or else. So uh, the, uh, the fact that both Russia and the West had important stakes in the outcome of that crisis made the Ukraine crisis uh, an international crisis. And uh, at this point, we're looking at the lowest point in relation between Russia and the West since the Cold War. And uh, uh, it can get worse. Cooperation between NATO and Russia is totally suspended. There is economic warfare. Sanctions, exchange of sanctions, is a form of economic warfare. Uh, and uh, there's propaganda warfare. And we're all experiencing that propaganda warfare because the Canadian media coverage of the crisis gives you anything but an objective picture of what's going on. In fact, I've been ashamed of the way even some of the best, some of the better journalists here have uh, managed to distort, uh, to uh, to omit important aspects, to to spin the news in a sustained, systematic manner, which makes it a form of propaganda warfare. And on the Ukrainian and on the Russian side, there are their own forms of a propaganda warfare. So just as in the Cold War, the truth is the first victim of this conflict. Heightened military activities, which uh, Greg has already referred to. By the way, yesterday, according to a CNN report, a Russian fighter plane flew within three meters uh, of, of an American warplane over the Black Sea. Uh, uh, the last such incident took place uh, a couple of months ago. Then the distance was six meters. I hope there won't be another uh, incident like that because they're getting perilously close to each other. Uh, but the fact is that, that uh, you know, the militaries on both sides are increasingly acting in this uh, kind of provocative mode challenging each other. In the Cold War, there used to be the game of chicken between the uh, nuclear submarines of uh, uh, the United States and Russia, where the skippers would be going straight toward the enemy submarine, and then uh, the enemy's uh, uh, skipper would be determined to hold on to the course, and whoever will swerve will be chicken. It was a matter of pride for naval officers not to, not to turn off. Uh, arms control and disarmament negotiations and the fate of treaties, some of the important uh, arms reduction treaties are now hanging in suspension. Uh, suspension. We may see some, some of them terminated. Uh, the uh, negotiations uh, uh, have uh, been suspended. The only kind of negotiations in this area uh, that are still going on are negotiations on Iran, where you have six major powers plus Iran. Uh, trying to forge an agreement to, which would effectively prevent the possibility that Iran might become a nuclear weapons state. So, a lively topic is this is a new Cold War. A new Cold War. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of the, uh, in the official circles, both East and West, there's a reluctance to call it uh, a new Cold War. And uh, the thing that you, the argument which you usually hear of why it's not a Cold War, they say, well, you know, it's no longer between communism and capitalism because Russia is a capitalist country. The ideological conflict is no longer there. A major dimension of the Cold War was Russia's challenge to capitalism as a socialist state. Now, Russia has about abandoned socialism. Russia has integrated itself into the capitalist economy. It has a capitalist class very powerful oligarchs and so on and so forth. So that is supposed to make us sleep better because it's not a cold war. Let me remind you that the two world wars of the 20th century started not between capitalist and, and socialist states, even though in the Second World War, of course, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, it acquired that ideological dimension. But then, immediately, major capitalist powers, Britain and the United States, jumped to Russia's side. Kind of underscoring the fact that the ideological dimension, while important, 
uh, dimension, while important, was not the main, it was a geopolitical conflict. So, a geopolitical conflict between the United States and China, between the United States and Russia, could escalate to, to prohibitive levels. So, whether or not it is a Cold War, which is an academic issue, our concern should be to prevent it from becoming a hot war. So, uh, in the Ukrainian crisis, in the, when, we, when we look for causes of the Ukrainian crisis, the internal causes, the fragility of the Ukrainian state, this constant warfare, political warfare between different oligarchs, between different parties, the regional splits, the cultural divisions that Halina was referring to are important. But without the international dimension, without the tendency, both in Russia and in the West, to view Ukraine in strategic geopolitical term, terms, regarding Ukraine as absolutely crucial for uh, the success of one side or, or another. Let me illustrate. Zbigniew Brzezinski, in a very influential text, which is called The Grand Chessboard, published in 1997 and uh, widely read by politicians, both in the West and in Russia, as a kind of a definitive text on the rules of modern geopolitics after the Cold War. Brzezinski writes in that text, Ukraine, a new and important space on the European chessboard, Eurasian chessboard, is a geopolitical pivot because its very existence as an independent country helps to transform Russia. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be a Eurasian empire. However, if Moscow regains control over Ukraine with its 52 million people, now 40, uh, the population has declined, also 2 million refugees as a result of, of this war, most of them, by the way, escaping to Russia. It's 52 million people and major resources, as well as access to the Black Sea. Russia automatically again regains the wherewithal to become a powerful imperial state spanning Europe and Asia. Uh, a Defense Department official in the senior Bush administration in 1991 uh, described Ukraine later in an interview uh, with uh, an American historian, described the importance of Ukraine in this way. We had a view that without Ukraine, a retrograde Russia would never reconstitute the Soviet Union. It would never become the threat posed by the Soviet Union because of the enormous resources and population and geography of Ukraine. So that would become an important element of US policy, putting aside all the principles that were all important. From the strategic point, an independent Ukraine became an instrument, an insurance policy. An independent Ukraine, which means independent from Russia, doesn't mean that it should be independent from the West. No, if it's dependent on the West, that means independent, because only free nations join the West, as we all know. Uh, another very interesting quote. This, uh, this is very recent. George Friedman is the head of a famous uh, organization called Strategic Forecasting, or Strat4. Uh, very influential non-government organization in, in Chicago, which pro provides on a daily basis analysis of important world events. Having visited Moscow in uh, January of this year, Friedman, uh, uh, on a, during the visit to Moscow, he gave an interview where he was quite frank about uh, the zero-sum game that is inevitable between Russia and the West over, U over Ukraine. This is how he put it in that Moscow interview. At the beginning of this year, there existed in Ukraine a slightly pro-Russian, though very shaky government. That situation was fine for Moscow. After all, Russia did not want to completely control Ukraine or occupy it. It was enough that Ukraine not join NATO and the EU. This is, by the way, incorrect. The, the, uh, the EU issue was manageable. Russian authorities cannot tolerate a situation in which Western armed forces are located a hundred or so kilometers from Kursk or Voronezh. These are major Russian cities in Western Russia. The United States, for its part, was interested in forming a pro-Western government in Ukraine. It saw that Russia was on the rise and was eager to let it consolidate, it was eager not to let it consolidate its position in the post-Soviet space. The success of the pro-Western forces in Ukraine would allow the United States to contain Russia. <laughs> Russia calls the events that took place at the beginning of this year, I mean, he was speaking in, in December 94, so it was referring to uh, 
the winter of 1914. Uh, uh, At the beginning of this year, a coup d'etat organized by the United States. Uh, one party here wants a Ukraine, that, meaning uh, Russia versus the United States. One party wants a Ukraine that is neutral. The other wants Ukraine to form part of a line of containment against Russian expansion. <coughs> One cannot say that either party is mistaken. <coughs> Both are acting based on their national interests. It's just that these interests don't jive. <coughs> the bottom line is that it is in the strategic interests of the United States to prevent Russia from becoming a hegemon. And it is in the interests, in the strategic interests of Russia, not to allow the United States to come to its borders. I don't think you can put it in, in, in simpler terms. Uh, but this describes the American perspective. What about the perspective of the Europeans? So Angela Merkel and uh, Francois Hollande, the, the, the Europeans in general. In a remarkable new study of the Ukrainian crisis, written by Richard Sakwa, a highly respected British academic specializing in Russia and Ukraine, it's called Frontline Ukraine, highly recommended book. Uh, he, he actually criticizes uh, the European Union for pursuing a policy with regard to expanding the Union eastward uh, in a way which would exclude Russia, in effect denying that Russia had any legitimate interest in uh, the former republics of the Soviet Union to the west of Russia, Ukraine being the most important case. So uh, Sakwa describes it as uh, in, in terms of two possible projects of Euro European expansion. One is wider Europe, the other is greater Europe. Now, wider Europe was the project adopted by the European Union. Wider Europe means that Brussels remain in charge, remains in charge. So Brussels, con Brussels continues to expand the realm of the European Union, enforcing the rules of the European Union, further and further eastward, and Russia would just have to swallow it and adapt to it. Now, the greater Europe uh, is based on a different premise, and it uh, uh, recognizes that there are multiple polars, poles of, of power and influence in Eurasia. So if you want to incorporate Russia in a greater Europe, you have to respect Russian sovereignty, Russia's interests, and so on. You can't regard the Russians as, you guys are in the way, why don't you just move over? Because we are expanding into Ukraine. So he uh, writes in his book, instead of concentric rings emanating from Brussels, weakening at the edges, but nevertheless focused on a single center, greater Europe posits a multipolar vision with more than one center and without a single ideological flavor. This is a pluralistic representation of European space and draws on a long European tradition, the vision of pan-European unification. So if the European expansion project had been based on the notion, on, the, on the, this view of greater Europe, which is inclusive and pluralistic, as opposed to wider Europe, which is very monistic and very much hegemonistic from the point of view of, of uh, the EU, uh, Ukraine crisis would not have become the tragedy that, that it became. So we're looking at a zero-sum game between Russia and the West, and uh, it's obvious to anyone uh, who knows anything about Ukraine, that if you play zero-sum geopolitical games over Ukraine, that destroys Ukraine. That destroys Ukraine. Uh, ten more? Uh, and uh, uh, why, uh, but, but why, should, why should anybody, if, if there are big geopolitical issues involved, if this is a game, uh, or if this is a policy which is aimed at preventing the rise of Russia, preventing the strengthening of Russia, the increase in the influence of Russia, even though Russia is not interested in zero-sum games. It wants a new balance of power, right? But if, if you're interested in that, then, well, you know, Libya, we sacrificed Libya, right? Because there was an important geopolitical project there. We can sacrifice Ukraine. We, it may be that Ukraine has already been sacrificed as a state to the greater goal of the expansion of the West uh, at the expense of Russia. So, uh, now, the m deeper meaning about the, of, of, of this conflict is that it's an attempt of the Western elites to prevent the erosion of Western power. And that erosion is going on. We know it. This world is sliding 
toward a different distribution of political and economic power. It's called multipolarity, a polycentrism. China is rising. The central global, so is India, so is Brazil. The distributional power in the world is going to be more pluralistic. It's not going, the West is not going to be able to maintain the stranglehold that it has, the dominance that it has. And it, in fact, it was a false perception of what happened in 1991, when as a result of the Soviet Union being dissolved by its own leaders, by the way, it was not dissolved by the uprising of the people. It was dissolved by the bureaucrats of the second rank of the Soviet uh, Communist Party and state bureaucracy with the Russians and the Ukrainians leading the way in an amicable deal. Hey, you know, we don't need the Soviet Union. We can be bosses within our, no, our own republics and let them be independent state. <laughs> no, no bad feeling toward each other. It's a shared interest. And then we both integrate into the global economy in Western terms, you know, according to our own interests and uh, uh, peculiarities. So the, this transition to a multipolar world is the big trend. And uh, the Ukraine crisis, if, uh, if Ukraine, if, if the government of Yanukovych had not been overthrown, Ukraine would have continued to balance between the West and Russia, but with increasing uh, emphasis on the maintenance and development of ties, not just with Russia, but also with the new integrative structure that is being built around Russia, and that's called the Eurasian Economic Union, which is patterned after the European Union. Very similar terms, expect, except that Russia is the driving force there. But it's not just about uh, reintegration of Soviet space. It's also about the growing alliance between Russia and China, which is going to be joined by India. By the way, uh, in July of this year, in a few weeks, uh, in the city of Ufa, the capital of Tatarstan, one of the Repub Islamic republics of Russia, there will be a summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was created by Russia, Europe, and uh, Russia, China, and, and four Central Asian states, to promote regional cooperation. A and the big decision that is expected there is the admission of India and Pakistan into this group. Imagine the implications. This is not a military alliance. This is a cooperative regional arrangement is focused primarily on the issues of the economy, social policy, infrastructure development, and so on and so forth, as well as security. So uh, uh, the uh, interesting thing is that this uh, summit of SCO might, be less, might have been less dramatic if the West has not chosen, had not chosen to punish Russia for its action on Ukraine. In fact, the West with its policy of sanctions and threats and so on, has pushed Russia away from the West, mm. thinking that if you push Russia away from the West, then Russia has nowhere to go. How short-sighted. By the way, I'm reminded of a book by a, Western, uh, by a West German historian written in the 1960s with a very characteristic title, Russia minus the West equals zero. And it's actually, the, the whole text is devoted to the importance of the European ideas in the rise and development of the Russian state, which is, by the way, 1,200 years old. And indeed, yes, Russia has uh, imported a lot of ideas, not only from the West, but also from the East. But being a great Eurasian state, it has very important other interests than selling gas to the European Union. In fact, we're now witnessing a possibility that Russia might, might stop selling gas to the European Union altogether and, okay, let them buy liquefied gas from the United States and pay twice the price, but then it will be all within the unified West, which is protecting its sacred borders from, uh, from Russian threats uh, because there are big markets in the East. So the, the interesting thing here is that uh, this, uh, uh, this conflict between Russia and the West is recognized by both sides as something which is not desirable, and yet that's something that is inevitable, which reminds me of the mindset of many political leaders of 1914. Nobody really wanted the big war, and at the same time they were acting as if such a war was inevitable. So action, reaction, process, how can I not respond says Obama 
uh, in, in response to uh, the decision of Russia to annex Crimea based on the uh, free expression of the uh, will of the people, but still annexation. So how, that's an intolerable threat to the world order, a blow to the world order. So whoever does that must be punished, all right? Okay, then, but, so what would be the Russian response? Yes, sorry, we did that, but we had to do that because we had an important interests involved and so on. We didn't want NATO to capture uh, Crimea, which might have been the case if we had not intervened, and so on and so forth. But expecting that Russia will be meekly accepting the Western punishment without responding, without doing anything in other directions of its foreign policy was very short-sighted. So the <laughs> process of the devolution of world power, which to some degree, I would say to a great degree, uh, precipitated the Ukraine crisis has actually received new impetus from that crisis. So it is the growing rift between Russia and the West, which I'm sure can be repaired because both sides are very wary of allowing the conflict to escalate much too much because we're looking at really massive nuclear arsenals on both sides, right? Deployable uh, uh, on a minute's notice. Uh, if, but this rift which is growing is actually a manifestation of the global transformation. It's not just about Ukraine. It's not just about Russia and the West. It's about the world which is falling out from Western influence. And I think that it is difficult, it's difficult for me to imagine any major event that would reverse this process. So the choices for the West are to gradually adapt to this shift and manage it, making sure that its interests are not unduly damaged in the process. Uh, the other option is to be ready for a war. Yeah. And I think that any sign uh, and any sane uh, political leaders would prefer to. And I think that, again, that remains the preferred choice. But things may get out of hand despite what our leaders have in mind, despite their best plans and so on. because. Ukraine has over 40 million people. It's the second largest country in Europe in terms of territory, and there's a civil war continuing there. And we should be thinking about ways of bringing that civil war to a negotiated end, and a possibility exists. It can be done, but it can only be done if the leaders in Washington and Moscow sit down and forge a deal. Thank you. So we'll now turn to uh, uh, Judy, who's a longtime peace activist in the, in, the, in Toronto and North America, and we'll pick up some of the themes about uh, patterns of American hegemony. Judy. Okay. Okay. Maybe coming from the United States, um, I'm not as sanguine <laughs> as you are. I mean, it's interesting that you. Um, uh, did speak about World War One because I, in my very introduction, I, I do allude to the um, World War One in, in terms of the unpredictability, really, of, of uh, history. Sure. Okay. So <clears throat> the Ukraine-Russia conflict is particularly ominous because it could escalate into a nuclear war. Yet the role of the United States is generally left out of the news, out of news reports and analyses. The political world is dangerously in flux right now with bilateral and multilateral military and economic alliances and a robust global arms trade, often shadowy, similar to the times preceding World War I when it took one trigger to unleash cascading interstate violence. Emeritus Professor of Russian History Stephen Cohn has spoken um, frequently uh, about the Ukraine-Russian situation. He said, this is a horrific, tragic, completely unnecessary war in eastern Ukraine. <clears throat> in my own judgment, we have contributed mightily to this tragedy, meaning the United States. I would say that historians one day will look back and say that America has blood on its hands, a new Cold War. But here's the difference. Because NATO has expanded for 20 years, but it's been primarily a political expansion, bringing these countries of Eastern Europe into our sphere of political influence, but now it's becoming a military expansion. Now this decision brings NATO right plunk on Russia's, Russia's borders. 
Russia will then leave the historic nuclear agreement that Reagan and Gorbachev signed in 1987 to abolish short-range nuclear missiles. Where are, by the way, the nuclear abolitionists today? Where is the grassroots movement you know by freeze and sane? Because we're looking at a new nuclear arms race. Russia moves these intermediate missiles now to protect its own borders as the West comes toward Russia, and the tripwire for using these weapons is enormous. I, I, I'm going to conclude the, uh, my, my talk with a quote from uh, some, some thoughts by, from Elaine Scarry, but I'll just mention now that she's a Harvard academic who's uh, worked a lot around abolition of nuclear weapons, and she comments on the fact that her students at Harvard, some of them have never heard of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. So, you know, there's the, the ignorance of the public is, is really very, very important here. Um, in a June 5th, 2015 report from Russia Today, um, they quote the, from the Associated Press, saying the Pentagon is considering scrapping a Cold War era treaty and deploying nuclear capable intermediate range cruise missiles in Europe over Moscow's alleged treaty violations. The uh, Associated Press reports that the U.S. administration is mulling deploying medium-range missiles in Europe and Asia that would be potentially capable of destroying military targets within Russian territory. This is citing an unclassified portion of a report written by the Office of General Martin Dempsey, Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. A number of critics decry the pro propagandistic framing of Ukraine-Russia as a black and white demonization of Putin, leaving out the culpability and danger posed by NATO nuclear weapons and patterns of U.S. hegemony. For example, I'll just quote a couple of people around this, uh, their comments about this. Marie Dobbin, um, um, the Thai in Vancouver, says, what are the consequences when elected governments make policy based on faith and imperial hubris instead of science and expertise. It's a question that is forcing itself on the world as we watch the United States, Britain, NATO, and the Harper government continue to up the ante in the confrontation with Russia over Ukraine. There are real enough geopolitical dangers in the world without actually creating them out of arrogance and ignorance, but that is where we are right now and consequences could be catastrophic. Canada, Britain, the US, and the boys with their toys in NATO headquarters are looking for a fight with Russia. Um, James Bissett, who was the former Canadian ambassador to, um, uh, to, to Yugoslavia. Yeah, Yugoslavia, that's right. Um, and I think uh, Albania, too, and, and Bulgaria. He said, the current crisis in Ukraine threatens global security <coughs> and at worst has the potential for nuclear catastrophe. At best, it signals the continuation of the Cold War. Sadly, the crisis is completely unnecessary, and the responsibility lies entirely in the hands of the United States, led NATO powers. The almost virulent propaganda onslaught blaming Russia for the instability and violence in Ukraine simply ignores reality and the facts. The American Friends Service Committee writes, corporate media outlets such as CNN, Fox News, and the New York Times have colluded with leaders in Washington to whip up a new Cold War sentiment against Russia while covering up the U.S. role in the recent violent events in Ukraine. Unmentioned by corporate media are the enormous U.S. financial and military interests at stake, from control of Ukraine's oil and gas pipelines connecting Russia with Western Europe to the prospect of NATO military bases on Russia's western border. Um, O'Hanlon, as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, um, wrote in, in Political Magazine, um, astonishingly writing um, this about NATO. He says, to be sure, Russia should not object to the expansion of NATO, an organization that has no hostile intent, no significant deployment of military forces near Russia's borders, and a primary focus on consolidating democracy and peaceful norms within Europe. So that's what he said about NATO. The Globe and Mail liberal columnist Doug Saunders writes this bewildering piece, Divorced from Reality, in which he stated that Putin is to blame for the downing of flight MH17, regardless of who actually shot the plane down, because, because Russia caused chaos in Ukraine. He wrote that all of Europe is under assault from Russia. That's from 2014. So I'm going to talk about um, four, four categories, NATO, 
Um, nuclear weapons, patterns of U.S. hegemony and economic strangulation. I'll try to talk quickly. <laughs> um, NATO was formed in 1949 as a defensive alliance against communism. In response, European communist states united under the Warsaw Pact six years later. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, Gorbachev and George H.W. Bush made a verbal agreement to allow the reunification of West and East Germany under condition that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. Shortly after, the Clinton administration staked out its stand, quote, that NATO should be able to act independently of the United Nations, end of quote. Unila and Clinton unilaterally decided to bomb Bosnia and soon after Serbia. The aim was not to put a stop to ethnic cleansing, to intervene in order to protect, but to preempt threats to the cohesion of NATO and the credibility of American power. Responding to the 1995 bombing campaign against the Bosnian Serbs, then Russian President Boris Yeltsin said, quote, this is the first sign of what could happen when NATO comes right up to the Russian Federation's borders. The flame of war could burst out across the whole of Europe. End of quote. But the Russians were too weak at the time to derail NATO's eastward movement, which at any rate did not look so threatening since none of the new members shared a border with Russia, save for the tiny Baltic countries. Strobe Tell, the Deputy Secretary of State under Clinton, strongly criticized NATO expansion. He said, Russia's resentment toward the United States and the crisis that erupted in March 2014 with Russia's occupation of Crimea were not unrelated to the Clinton administration's insistence in the 1990s that NATO be expanded to Russia's borders. It seemed like virtually everyone I knew from the world of academe, journalism, and foreign policy think tanks was against enlargement. George Kennan, um, who had been uh, for some time uh, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, was the author of the uh, policy of containment. Um, he termed enlargement a strategic blunder of potentially epic proportions. He said expanding NATO would be the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era, he wrote. Such a decision may be expected to inflame the nationalistic, anti-Western, and militaristic tendencies in Russian opinion to have an adverse effect on the development of Russian democracy, to restore the atmosphere of the Cold War to East-West relations, and to impel Russian foreign policy and directions decidedly not to our liking. Contrary to the verbal promise to Gorbachev to not expand NATO one inch, NATO did expand membership in NATO bases to the East. In 1999, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined NATO. Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia joined NATO in 2004. At the April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, the United States supported inviting Georgia and Ukraine to join the alliance. John Mearsheimer writes of the significant April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest. The first, he said it was the first indication of what was to come. France and Germany opposed the move for fear that it would unduly antagonize Russia. In the end, NATO's members reached a compromise. The alliance did not begin the formal process leading to membership, but it issued a statement endorsing the aspirations of Georgia and Ukraine and boldly declaring, quote, these countries will become members of NATO. Russia made it clear that this was unacceptable, but NATO didn't back off. In May, the EU announced that there would be an Eastern partnership. By August, there was war between Georgia and Russia. Georgia thought NATO would back them in a conflict with Russia, but they didn't. A little bit reminiscent of the Kurds' hope um, uh, in, in their uh, uh, war against, in their fight against uh, Iraq, when they hoped that the U.S. Would, would help them. Afterwards, Obama failed to reset relations with Russia. The U.S. continued to pursue the policy of pulling Ukraine in from the Russian orbit and integrating it into the West. NATO expansion continue, continued marching forward with Albania and Croatia becoming members in 2009. I want to say something about the organization of NATO. Um, this is from a recent book, um, very interesting book by Michael Glennon, um, who analyzes the deep state. It becomes readily apparent, he said, that the U.S. executive is the sole organ of the federal government in the field of international relations. Executive decisions around military, surveillance, security do not require congressional approval. 
By the deep state, he variously describes the, the National Security Council bureaucracy, the National Security Council, and the National Security Team, a relatively small number of elite bureaucrats who make up the single most powerful staff in the United States. He writes that they define security in military and intelligence terms rather than political and diplomatic ones. This encourages this exaggeration of existing threats and the creation of imaginary ones. The setup is devoid of meaningful constraints, and this part is really important. He says, in fact, international law affords great deflective possibilities. The UN Charter and, NATO, and the NATO Treaty provide ever useful cover. I think that's what um, Jeff Halper, if any of you know his work, and others call lawfare. It makes, makes making crime fit the law. The rules of the UN Charter concerning the use of force can plausibly be marshaled to support virtually any US military action deemed in the national interest. The NATO organization itself provides credibility, flexibility, and anonymity in equal doses. Its council has no substantive written rules of procedure. It issues no legal guidance or guidelines that might restrict member states. It exercises no standalone authority since member states have delegated none. No internal rules exist that would render NATO responsible for a violation of international law. The organization's policy is not to reveal which member state participated in a military operation. All of this gives NATO its greatest asset, its capacity to serve as a veil. NATO shields member states from legal and political accountability. There have been no congressional or parliamentary inquiries, no demonstrations outside embassies, and no legal actions threaten member states. Also, this new Cold War must be put into the context of what is happening in the Arctic. Greg alluded to this in his introduction. This is also where Canada is important as the West prepares for Arctic warfare. Heightened U.S. interest in the Arctic Ocean for energy, just heightened interest by the U.S. Um, for energy, transportation, and military purposes. There is a 36-page document released by the U.S. Department of the Navy called the Arctic Roadmap 2009. Here, here are the key components. The United States has broad and fundamental national security interests in the Arctic region. These interests include missile defense and early warning, deployment of sea and air navigation, and overflight to secure U.S. sovereign rights over extensive marine areas, including the valuable natural resources they contain. In the document, the U.S. declares the territories within the Arctic Circle a zone of, of its strategic interest. NATO follows the American Arctic Initiative and proclaimed that the high north is going to require even more of the alliance's attention in the coming years. The U.S., Canada, Denmark, and Norway were represented as founding members of the military bloc. Russia was not invited to send even an observer. The Russian news report wrote of the inescapable logic of the meeting. It said, NATO is seriously thinking of establishing military presence in the Arctic. It considers global warming and consequently an Arctic thought as an occasion for this. NATO sees this as, an, as a possibility for its Arctic expansion. It is Canada that has been appointed the role of vanguard in the impending showdown with Russia over the Arctic. Ottawa has conducted its, its largest ever military exercises, established new bases, and exhibited increasing truculence, truculence and saber rattling towards Russia and the region. Washington and Brussels, meaning the EU, has employed Canada to confront Russia. US and NATO radar, submarine, and missile deployments in the high north will complete the encirclement of Russia. Um, for my, I'm, I'm also a psychoanalyst, and I must make a, a comment on, the, on the, the fact that psychopaths experience no tension or conflict about lying. Anders um, Fogras Moussen, former Secretary General of NATO, reported in Al Jazeera, quote, We are pretty close to the new Cold War because of Russia's illegal actions in Ukraine. I would say NATO is the most successful peace movement the world has ever known. He said that the accusation of encirclement of Russia is not justified, that NATO encirclement is not a threat against Russia, about the promise, about the promise to not move one inch further east, he said that view is pure propaganda. He said it's the right thing to expand. Each and every nation has the right to decide whether to join the alliance. Russia benefits from a zone of security, 
Encirclement is paranoid, he said. The root, cause, the root cause of the problem is Russian expansion. NATO expansion brings prosperity. <laughs> the current, um, the current commander um, of NATO, is, is, his name is Breedlove. He Strange Breedlove. <laughs> he announced that 40,000 Russian troops were massing on the border, but in the age of forensic satellite evidence, he offered, he offered no evidence about the, um, about the massing of troops. This was reported in Der Spiegel. They said German leaders in Berlin were stunned. They didn't understand what Breedlove was talking about, and it wasn't the first time. Once again, the German government, supported by intelligence gathered by Germany's foreign intelligence agency, did not share the view of NATO's supreme allied commander. The pattern has become a familiar one. For months, Breedlove has been commenting on Russian activities in eastern Ukraine, speaking of troop advances on the border, the amassing of munitions, and alleged columns of Russian tanks. Over and over again, Reed Love's numbers have been significantly higher than those in the possession of America's NATO allies in Europe. I contrast this with the statement by Chomsky in um, on Democracy Now! Um, about the U.S. military equipment taking part in the military parade in Estonia. I think this was in February. He, um, so he was commenting on this, this military parade a couple hundred yards from the Russian border. He said, Russia is surrounded by U.S. offensive weapons. Sometimes they're called defense, but they're all offensive weapons. And the idea that the new government in Ukraine that took over after the former government was overthrown last December, it passed a resolution of overwhelmingly, I think, something like eight, 300 to 8 or something, um, announcing its intention to take steps to join NATO. No Russian leader. That no Russian leader, um, no matter who, who it is, could tolerate Ukraine right at the geostrategic center of Russia, Russian concerns, joining a hostile military alliance. Now, I can give you many examples, um, actually this year from February on to now, about um, NATO deployments um, around Russia, but I'm going to say that in case there is time, because I want to get to some of the things. Um, uh, but there's, there's uh, quite a lot of documentation and evidence of, of the deployments you know, right around Russia. So I want to talk now about nuclear weapons. Again, alluding to what um, Greg talked about in, in the introduction. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists this year advanced their doomsday clock warnings of human extinction to three minutes before midnight. Yet major meetings on eliminating nuclear weapons go unreported. This spring saw the UN Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference, the New York Symposium Dynamics of Possible Nuclear Extinction, and the Quebec World Uranium Symposium. So this is in the, just the past few months, and none of this has been reported in the media. The Nonproliferation Treaty came into effect in 1970 and has two parts, nonproliferation and elimination of nuclear weapons. But actions belie words. In 2014, President Obama allocated $1.1 trillion for upgrading nuclear weapons over the next three decades. This spring, nuclear-equipped nations rejected calls to take nuclear weapons of high alert status, increasing the risk of accidental or impulsive nuclear war. Canada is a signatory to the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but Harper has violated the terms of the treaty by selling uranium to India, a, not, a nuclear weapons state that has not signed the treaty. Canada is a member of NATO, and NATO is in violation of the NPT by refusing to rule out offensive first use of nuclear weapons. Despite member states' commitment to transparency in the 2002, in the 2000 NPT final document, NATO does not disclose details about its nuclear weapons. Specific to the escalating nuclear threat, there is a historical pattern of U.S. action and previously USSR um, counter-reaction in the escalation of the arms race. For example, the first U.S. nuclear chain reaction was in 1942, and the first um, nuclear chain reaction in, in the USSR was in 1946. The first atom bomb was uh, 1945 the U.S., 1949 USSR. The accelerated buildup of strategic missiles was 1961 in the U.S. and 1966 the USSR. 
Multiple warheads and missiles was new in 1964 in the U.S. Um, nine years later in the USSR, computerized guidance on missiles in 1970 and five years later in the USSR. The collapse of the Soviet Union heralded a sad history of might have been. In 1991, George H.W. Bush and Gorbachev signed the START Treaty to begin the process of eliminating thousands of nuclear weapons. But the U.S. simultaneously launched a massive assault on Iraq, stationing nuclear weapons in the Persian Gulf. More setbacks followed. George W. Bush unilaterally pulled out of the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the cornerstone of nuclear weapons deterrence and international security. So he did that in 2002. Ballistic missile defense um, uh, is, uh, is widely recognized as the weaponization of space, with highly destructive offensive weapons placed in or guided from space. The message is that no potential challenge to U.S. hegemony will be tolerated. The U.S. maintains the right of first use of nuclear weapons. Missile defense and other military programs of the Bush and Obama administrations are inherently provocative to Russia and China. The 1998 U.S. Space Command concept of global engagement included space-based strike capabilities that would allow the U.S. to attack any country and to deny similar capability to any other countries. The threat to use nuclear weapons is itself a violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty according to the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Yet this April, members of the European Parliament declared that the EU's readiness for nuclear war quote, is one of the best steps to deter Russia from further aggression. Astonishingly, the Harper government just blocked a Russian delegation from attending an international conference in Ottawa aimed at stopping the spread of nuclear weapons. The United States has contingency, contingency plans for the use of nuclear weapons against both nuclear and non-nuclear states. Theodore Postal, MIT professor emeritus, recently wrote in The Nation, and I highly recommend you uh, look up his article, which is really excellent. Um, he, he wrote an article in The Nation that the danger of nuclear war is much higher now than in the Cold War. He notes US false, the U.S. false belief that a nuclear war is winnable, that the U.S. recklessly treats nuclear weapons as if they're conventional, conventional weapons. Further, he writes that Russia has a fragile early warning system, leaving as little as six minutes to determine whether to launch a nuclear counterattack. Postal says that the Russians are aware of the, of the vulnerability in their system and are also aware of the United States' relentless preoccupation with building nuclear weapons systems. Postal writes that the nuclear weapons overhaul announced by Obama focuses on improving the accuracy of long-range land and sea-based ballistic missile warheads and on increasing the killing power <laughs> okay the killing power of other nuclear uh, 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 the killing power of nuclear warheads but a close analysis reveals a technically sophisticated effort to ready US nuclear forces for direct confrontation with Russia sophisticated russian analysts especially those who understand the technical aspects of nuclear weapons see the U.S. modernization drive as a disturbing indication that the U.S. military believes a nuclear war against Russia can be fought and won. Postal concludes that the modernization effort significantly increases the chances of an accident during an unpredicted, unpredicted and unpredictable crisis, one that could escalate beyond anyone's capacity to imagine. In terms of uh, the unpredictability aspect, I would also recommend uh, Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control. Eric Schlosser is known for his work on, um, on food, fast food uh, nation, but uh, his, his book on command and control, you, uh, if you have any, any sense of, of security, uh, you, should, you should read it in terms of the nuclear weapons world. Um, I just have probably half a minute now. I wanted to, um, in, the, uh, in my talk, also touch on the whole history of, of um, US, uh, U.S. involvement in regime change, which probably some of you are, are quite familiar with. Um, uh, so many of the same kinds of techniques uh, you know, were, have, have been used by, by um, Victoria Newland and, and uh, the $5 billion of, of investment in, in, in uh, destabilizing Ukraine. 
Um, the story of Newman, I think you should also know, is, is uh, married to um, Robert Kagan, who's one of the authors of the Project for the New American Century, and uh, was one of the main architects of the, of the intervention in Libya. Um, so I, I, I uh, maybe I'll just read one of those paragraphs. So I also wanted to talk briefly about the economic strangulation. I can just say that pretty much one word. That according to the UK Guardian, was a really interesting article um, about the the uh, um, Saudi U.S. deal to to uh, flood the world, um, the oil world with oil to bring down the prices of of of, um, of oil and uh, to really again to destabilize particularly Russia but also Iran and Venezuela and uh, then there's a very interesting report from the Oakland Institute on on um, the buying up of uh, the privatization of buying up of, of um, agricultural, the rich agricultural land in Ukraine, and of course the um, the austerity, the IMF austerity, typical austerity um, arrangements with, with Ukraine. Um, uh, I'll just quote John Pilcher. <laughs> I was going to talk about John Pelger, Thomas Johnson, and, and uh, John McMurtry, some more they did. But I'll just end with John Pelger. Since 1945, more than a third of the membership of the United Nations, 69 countries have suffered some or all of the following at the hands of America's modern fascism. They have been invaded, their governments overthrown, their popular movements suppressed, their elections subverted, their people bombed, and their economies stripped of all protection. Their society is subjected to a crippling siege known as sanctions. Um, U.S. involvement in coups against democratically elected governments and the insulation of di dictators include the Shah of Iran, General Suharto in Indonesia, Batista in Cuba, Somoza in Nicaragua, Pinochet in Chile, Mobutu in Congo Zaire, Lobo in Honduras. Um, he also uh, writes about the late 20th century tortures, disappearance, Death squads, military coup, and right wing pogroms against workers, peasants, and the educated in most Latin American countries. So um, we could talk a lot more. <laughs> but uh, it's, I think it's, the message, of course, is, is that you can't just talk about Russia and Ukraine. You have to really look at the context of, of the United States and, um, and NATO and nuclear weapons. <laughs>